was a stranger. And you invited me in. I was sick. And you looked after me. I needed a teacher. And you inspired me. I was lost. And you prayed for me. I was addicted. And you helped me break free. I needed a mentor. And you were there for me. I felt alone. And you showed me true community. You helped me experience the joy of worship. You made me feel welcome and safe. You gave me the strength to keep going. You led me to Jesus. Sunday, the day that changed the world. And today, we are looking at the title, Transformers, because that's who we are. One of the last couple of things that you saw in that video was that um, help us to transform lives, and we can't do it alone. Tell your neighbor, we can't do it alone. If you're online, just... Text that to somebody. We can't do this alone. Uh, let everybody know that we need your help. Um, Sunday morning, that's why we, I, we call this Sunday the day that changed the world. Sunday morning of Easter, which we celebrated last week, that day changed everything for the rest of the world forever. It's changed. It was, it was, it's, it, it's different than it was uh, before that particular day, because that, were, that was actually an event that happened. Easter morning, the resurrection was an event. Jesus actually did get up. It wasn't mystical. It wasn't magic. He actually got up from the dead. And so we want to continue to celebrate that. That's the event that happened. And what that put into motion was God's plan that he had for, before the foundations of the world was. So that's why you got to realize that this is a big deal. This is a big deal to God. This is something he waited for centuries on. He waited for a couple thousand, few thousand years to do this. And finally, it happens where Jesus is actually on the scene. He's gone through his life. He's made it all the way through his life. And then he, they kill him. They arrest him and kill him. And so now... He's dead, and everybody, and even the people who were with him for the three and a half years watched him do miracles. That's why miracles is, is not the final thing. They watched Jesus do miracles. They watched Jesus raise people from the dead. They watched Jesus just heal all kinds of folks. But when he was dead, they thought it was over. And the same thing happens today. When people look at the church and the church is not active, they think it's over. They think it's over. And there's so many things that have happened that would just knock so many Christians, so many Jesus followers out of the box that we forget that there is a plan that God has in store. And it, his plan, it changed the entire world, not just the Jerusalem world where they were, not just the Jewish area where they were, but it, he wanted this good news to reach everyone in the world. And it could now be shared, since because it couldn't even be shared to everybody in the world before Jesus was crucified and before he was raised from the dead, before his death. And so the church has a big part to play in this. The church is in the world to do two things. 
mainly. There are multiple things that the church is in, world, in the world to do. But the two things, and we talked about them in these two things in our last series. One is to minister to the people that are inside of the body of Christ. And we continue to do that. And the motivation for all of this, for both of these things, is the love of God. It's that love that he talked about when that last day that he was with his disciples. And after Judas had left the room to go and betray him, he was sitting there with his disciples, with the rest of his disciples, and he said to them, a new commandment I give to you, and that is that you love one another as I have loved you. That's different, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into that. But Jesus said to those same disciples earlier, he says, upon this rock I will build my what? My church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is so strong from the inside out, from what Jesus put into it, and that's why we need to remember who we are, relive who we are, be active in who we are, allow the love, that same love that he talked about, because that's the energy that create, that we, that puts, that's the energy he put on the inside of us. That love is the impetus that helps us to do what we need to do. And so, but there is a cost. Tell you, they, no, I won't do that. I, no, I can't. <laughs> it's like, am I going to sit here and talk to my neighbor all day? No. <laughs> tell somebody. No, tell, some, <laughs> tell yourself that there is a cost. Think about it. There is a cost. And recently what I have noticed is the cost is so visual to us that it looks bigger than the reward of what the repay is. Um, the cost, of, and I call it the cost of inconvenience because it's, I mean, sometimes it's not like in, you know, last Sunday, and we'll look at a couple, one of those scriptures, some of those men gave their lives for the cause. They laid it down. But, and we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about the inconvenience. But, but personal inconvenience and, that's, and it is personal. It's your personal inconvenience because you personally have a responsibility to do your part as far as the two reasons that God has given the church to do, and that is to love one another, to actually minister to one another. And that second reason is the mission to the world, the mission to those who are unbelievers. That mission is, needs to be so strong and so alive on the inside of us that we wake up every morning thinking about that. So last week, I asked you to imagine, um, how many of you remember last week, I asked you to imagine what it would be like if there were no Christian values in your world? Remember, I asked you to look at that? Because a lot of those, a lot of what you imagine, you're not, you're really not imagining anything brand new. You are imagining where the presence of God is not. (laughs) Because there are Christians in the world, but we're just not everywhere, and we're just not all doing what we need to do. But if you could imagine if there was no organizations in the world that were impacted by the love of God, you see, inconvenience will lead us to that place. It'll make it comfortable for us not to do what we need to do. But we need to, what your personal inconvenience for a short time does, if you would inconvenience yourself for a short time, it gives somebody else the experience of God's grace. And and so many people have never experienced God's grace. See, God's grace doesn't just fall from the sky. Sometimes that's what we feel like. Well, if we're going to experience God's grace, you know, we just lift our hands and open our hearts and we just feel it like rain. You know, it doesn't really fall like rain. God's grace is experienced between who? People. God's grace is experienced through people. God's peace is experienced through people. Peace is experienced through people. The absence of peace is because people are doing things that are not peaceful. Think about it. The absence of love is when there's no love between people. You don't feel, how many of you felt love from the clouds? Like the puffy clouds, just full of love. I just just feel bubbly today. Just God is just so good. It's just, you know, 
Anyway, I think you get it. But, but you, individually you, you have the opportunity to impact generations. And that's what I want to lay out today. We're going to talk about generations. But, you know, last week I asked you to imagine what it would be like if you, um, in your world, there were just no Christian values. There was, in other words, there's no Jesus. There are no Christians anywhere at any workplace. Um, how many of you have gone to a place where there were no Christians? I, I remember growing up in, in school, I was always looking for someone who was a believer. Now, I was messed up for more than one reason, because I didn't think anybody was going to heaven anyway except for the people who went to my church. So I didn't see any of them at school, so I thought all them folks was going to hell. But I still had, even if I thought that, I had the wrong attitude. I should have been trying to talk to them. But instead, I, was, I'm, I just had to, I'm holy. I'm going. I got my life together. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. But last week, I asked you to imagine what that would be like. And I have a question for you today. So when you think of your local church, will your, and this is hard, so I'm going to hit some of you square. I'm, I'm smiling. And I have a heart full of love, but you're going to be like, ooh, that hurt. So when you think of your local church, would your activity convey the image of a passive consumer or an engaged contributor? Mmm. Mmm. Let me ask it in a different way. And highlight a couple of words. <laughs> when you think of your local church, think about it if there were no churches in your city. No influence of Jesus on any corner. I know sometimes when I first came to Flint, I was like, oh my God, there's three churches on that corner. I was like, and there's another one over there and another one over there and one, two just down the street. Churches right next door to each other. I was like, what in the world is going on? But you know what? God has many visions for different kinds of people in different communities, and it takes all of those churches to reach those people. And so I, I, stopped, I stopped, like, thumbing my nose down or up, however you thumb your nose, at churches because there's just so many churches because we need churches we need churches who actually do, should do what churches need to do and so when you think of your local church would your activity convey the image of a consumer that means and let me tell you what a consumer is a consumer consumes a consumer eats up all the words like thank god i got a good message today <laughs> God is so good. God, my, mm, I'm ready for the week. That's consumption. You're consuming, right? Still with me? Consumer is someone, even last Sunday, how many of you enjoyed the, the worship and the music? It's like, ooh, that just made me feel so good. It was just, uh, ooh. And then we talk about, you know, many of you, you're familiar with Tremel. He says, I love Tremel singing. Oh, just my goodness. And everyone we've had here that sings, we just, and so that's consuming. You're consuming. But involvement is, is like, it's kind of like, you probably heard the story between the chicken and the, and the pig. You never heard the story between the chicken and the pig? where the chicken lays the egg, right? And the people consume the egg, and the chicken is still alive. But if you want some bacon, that pig got to give up his life. So I can see now some of you would rather be a chicken. <laughs> you don't want to be that involved. But I promise you, you won't have to be that involved. You can still help people get their bacon and not give up your life. But something has happened since the pandemic. It seems like nobody wants to work anywhere. I don't know if you've noticed, if you, even if you talk to uh, recruiters online, I get 
three to four messages almost every day from headhunters that are just looking for people like me to go and work somewhere and offering all kinds of uh, bonuses and sign-on bonuses and all everything. And then the people, even if I, some people have come and started for a couple of days and left and went somewhere else. People just, their, their work ethic is gone. It's just gone. But, and the same thing is happening with church throughout the nation on Sunday mornings. And I want Jesus followers. I'm not just talking to Christians. I'm talking about people who say they follow Jesus. Because if you really are a Jesus follower, you will get involved with what Jesus cares about. And that's people. I want Jesus followers to get so excited about Sunday morning. I want Sunday morning to be the most exciting day of anybody's week. I don't care what your age is, but because of you know what's happening on Sunday morning, that's your most exciting day of the week. So, again, imagine last week, if there was no church, no Christian values, no Jesus. And then imagine how you can impact somebody in each generation. I'm going to show you there are about six generations on earth today. There are about six generations, a possible six generations. And I want you to imagine how you can impact somebody in each generation with the good news of who Jesus is and about God's love. Just every single generation. And I'm going to go right down through them. The first one is the silent generation. That's people born from 1928 to 1945. How many of you know someone in that generation? Okay. Many of you, if your parents are still alive, they're probably in that generation and or grandparents. Uh, but these, they were called the silent generation because of the children, they were children of the Great Depression. And they, they, would, they would just learn to stay within the system, keep your head down, uh, and work hard. That's why they were called the silent generation. And play it safe. Don't create a ruckus. Don't, don't, they weren't risk takers. They, they, were, they just kept quiet to keep the peace and keep things going. And how, how many of you are in this generation? <laughs> okay. Oh, not me. I'm, 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 um, if you're online and you're in this generation, let us know. We want to identify people because, if, and, and I know many of you here today said, you raised your hand and said you know people in that generation. Imagine how you could impact their lives with the love of God. They may already be a Christian. They may already love Jesus, but are they involved or are they just consuming? And how can you impact their lives to actually be a real Jesus follower. Think about those people in that category. Then we have the next category, which I know some of you are in, uh, baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. Those are people who are 59 years old and uh, up to 77. And these were the children of the previous children, basically children after World War II. And that was, that's why they call them baby boomers, because there was a spike in the birth rates. After World War II, all the soldiers came home, <laughs> and you can imagine the rest. And at, at one time in history, this was the largest generation on earth. This age group was the largest generation on earth. So all of the marketing systems, that's who they marketed to. That's who they targeted to. The automobile industries, that's why they built Buicks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and not just Buicks, but every, um, everybody, <laughs> no, no offense to people who drive Buicks today. You know, it's not just for old folks, but a Buick is a nice riding car, I tell you that right now. My first car was a Buick. My daddy gave it to me, and he was from, anyway. Um, 
But how many of you are in this group? Just, you know, wave your hand. If you're online, uh, just say, I'm in this group. This is my group. I'm a baby boomer. Uh, if you, even if you're not in the group, how many of you know people in this group? You just wait. Yeah, even if you're online, just say, I know some people. Um, how do you impact people in this group? So some of these are in the same stage of life as you are in, but for some of you, this is a cross, you know, you, you, you have to reach a cross, gener- this is a cross-generational thing, but you need to know how to do that even if you're not in this generation, how do I impact people that are in this generation because of the way they think and what they've gone through and what they do? How do you impact them with the love of God? They may be Christians. They even may be Jesus followers, but are they just, say the word with me, consumers or are they involved? We need to get involved. I think we have a lot of consuming Christians who are See, I was going to say at home, possibly watching me today, but I'm going to show you how you can still be at home and not be a consumer. How about that? Be like, ooh, yeah, I I can handle that. Not forever. You can't just stay home forever, but you can stay home sometimes and not be a consumer because you are involved. And that's one of the things the church needs to do today is learn how to get people involved without having to be in person every single time. But we have to agree to be in person at some time. Amen? Amen. And so here's the next generation. The next generation is Generation X. These are basically the children of the boomers. And how many of you know people in this generation? Okay. How many of you are in this generation, Ravy? Okay, (laughs) we got some Generation X people here. These are people between 43 and 58 years old. And um, how do you, so they're different kind of people, right? How do you reach these people? Huh? (laughs) How, How do you reach these people? Even if you're in the same age group, even if you're in the same stage of life, How do you reach these people? Think about it. How do you impact their lives with the love of God that's in you to the point where they can experience the love and grace of God? How do you do that so that they are not just inspired to be a consumer, but they're inspired to be involved at what God is doing in the earth right now, inspired to get it done, inspired to reach out and help people, inspired to actually talk to people about what real love is, people who are hurting, who come to them every single day, or who they see pass by them every day, and it looks like something's wrong, and you feel like, man, I should just see if everything's all right. But then you're like, no, I'm going to leave people alone. And we just back off and say nothing, and people are still hurting in all those different generational age groups. Amen? And, and, and when, you, when you find yourself in that situation, especially when you are um, not in that same generation, let's say that you're in one of the you know, previous generations, a boomer or either silent generation, and you're trying to reach people in that age group, um, many times you can use your experience to reach them because they may be going through or about to go through what you've already been through. And it doesn't have to be a religious thing. It's just life. Just share your life. I almost put an adjective in front of that. (laughs) But then the next group is the millennials, and we heard a lot about the millennials. Um... The, they're called millennials because they became, these are the group of people that become adults right around the turn of the century. And not just the century, but the turn of the millennium. So, millennia. So, these are 2K adults. These are two, the adults, become, they're becoming adults around the year 2000. And, and, and they are a different group of people because they were born, they were born into what we consider a world of abundance. And you probably heard it more times than not where they feel entitled where there's entitlement. But those are all the negative things about the millennials. The millennials bring plenty of positive things. You need millennials. You need these people on your team. You need them in your family. 
You need them, that you need help from them. But how do you influence them? So we have to, depending on what age group you're in, what generation you're in, you have to figure out a way to influence them where you can impact them, where they can be. Because, see, they won't really, they won't hang around to just be a consumer. If they're not involved, they ain't hanging around. Think about millennials. They're like, I ain't, that's why they don't even come to church. I'm not just, what? Come, come what? Did that, done that? Parents did that? I'm looking at my parents. They go to church every day and they argue, fight. Why should I go to church? Millennials think like that. They're like, you telling me about all this love. My mom and daddy, they go to church and they smile every single day while they're at church. Then they come home and fight. And then they want me to go to church. I ain't going nowhere. That's the way they feel. So how do you impact that entire generation? How do you impact that family to experience the real love of God? We have to get real. Address the messy stuff that is real that nobody wants to talk about. And then we have the next generation. Generation Z. These are <laughs> Generation Z is a special generation of folks. They were born between 1997 and 2012. In other words, they're, right now they're from 11 years old to 26 years old. And you know what? They're one of the biggest users of TikTok. And you know why? Because on TikTok, 83% of TikTokers don't just watch, they don't just consume, they create. 83% of TikTokers, they have created a video. And they make it so easy to do. If churches don't start making things easy to do, they ain't getting nobody from this generation. But you can see, and, and, and when I say that, I don't mean like you got to start doing what the world does to entice people because of their flesh. Nah, that's not what I'm talking about. God created all human beings, and all human beings have certain instincts and certain things. There's things you like, things you don't like. There's reasons you like it. Same thing with this group of people. There's reasons they like certain things, reasons they don't like certain things. And so we have to figure out who they are and actually market to that generation with the love of God. All we have to make sure we have is the love of God as our motive. That's the motive. That kind of love. We're going to talk about that. I, I, I promise you I'm going to use the scripture in a minute. I know you're like, when is he going to get to the Bible? We have one more generation. Gen Alpha. These are kids now from zero to ten years old. All right? And most of these are children of millennials. So they're experiencing what their parents are going through. And some of these are younger, they're the younger siblings of Generation Z. So they're experiencing all of these things. You know, um, here's, here's, here's the thing I want to say about this generation. By the year 2025, when these, when the oldest of these will be, the, will actually be in that age group, year 2025, this will be the largest generation on earth ever in history, bigger than the baby boomers were. So, we must reach this generation. We, when you see a 10-year-old child walk by you, whatever they're doing, don't just try to correct them. You got to reach them. One thing, and I'm going to show you this book so that you can read it if you would like to. 
It's called Come Sit With Me. I don't know if any of you have read this book or heard of this book before. <sighs> wow. Why did that get me like that? We need to reach these people. Every generation, even if they're not going to be the biggest generation on earth, we need to reach them. We need to find a way to reach them. We need to impact their lives. I was about to say about this book, one phrase in this book is, connect before you correct. Connect before you correct. And that's one of the things we have to learn when we're connecting, when we're trying to reach someone, in a, especially in a different generation. You got to make a connection first. Then you can start correcting. But many of us, because of our parents, they had, they've corrected first. You got to smack in the mouth first. And then they told you why you got smacked. Anybody ever got one of those? Boom! And you're like, what the? Boom! So, remember last week we looked at the scripture? Acts, the sixth chapter, right after the, this was about, you know, seven, well, at least seven weeks after the resurrection. And as they were going on, these were within those first few years. It says, in those days, when the, the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among, the, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So something was going on here where these, and there were people in every different generation that, were, that was here, and not just every kind of generation as far as age group, every kind of ethnic group from everywhere around. They were all here. As a matter of fact, the Hellenistic Jews were Jews that were from other areas that didn't even speak the same Jewish language as the people in Jerusalem, but they were all there at the same time because of the holiday. Uh, the Passover is gone, and this is seven weeks past Passover where the, all these people are together, and that's when the day of Pentecost was when people start speaking different languages. It wasn't so much that they were speaking the different languages as it was that everyone else heard them speak the goodness of God in their own language. That's what they heard. No matter what their ethnic background was, they heard the goodness of God from the same people who did not speak their language. And so we have to learn to do the same thing today, even if it's not speaking physically or, or, or audibly. We need to learn how to speak the same language as the people we're trying to get the message to. Speak their language. And they'll be saying, wow, he's talking to me. He's saying something that's reaching me, regardless of what generation they're in. And the love of God, which was the same love of God that motivated these people, is the same love of God. That's what motivates you to be able to do that. And so they had an issue that came up, and that's why the scripture is here, showing us exactly what happened when they did this. There was, there was a, a number of disciples that, were, when they were increasing, there were some complaints. Say complaints. There was some com complaints. And so the 12, which is talking about the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Uh, not that they were too good to serve tables. Not that they were so good that we, we can't lower ourselves to do this. But leaders can't do everything. And even if you're not a leader, you can't do everything. You need multiple levels of leadership. We need multiple <laughs> levels of leadership. But these people were determined to take care of the problem. The love was motivated to actually solve the issue. The people who were hungry, the widows that were complaining, that didn't even live in Jerusalem or had just moved there just because of what was happening after Jesus' resurrection, these were brand new people. It was like, it was as if there was, you know, um, oh, a good example would be like people who were trying to escape out of Ukraine and they're going to neighboring countries where so many came that it overwhelmed the system. That's kind of what it would be like. That's what it was like in Jerusalem at this time. So many people were in Jerusalem. It was overwhelming the system, so they couldn't take care of everybody. So the church is what stood up and said, let's take care of these widows. 
let's do this. Let's make sure we do this. They weren't even from there, from their, from their city. But they said, well, let's do this. But the 12 leaders said, we, if we start doing this, we can't do what we need to do, the things that only we can do. See, there are some things that only you can do. You need to make sure that that's your priority. And then if you can actually delegate some other things that you can do but other people can do also, then you need to learn how to delegate those things so that other people can do that. And that's what happened with the disciples right here, with the apostles. They said, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. In other words, he's saying the whole responsibility... We're going to turn it over to you. You manage this. There are multiple things in the church where we just need to turn it over to somebody and say, you manage it. But we have, it's hard, so many people, church leaders, sometimes it's hard for them to take their hands off of things. You ever had a church leader whose hands is in everything? I know you ain't. Yeah, okay. That's not the message, is it? That's not the message. <laughs> but they said, choose seven men that you know that, you know, that, that can handle this. He said, and, and they said, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. We need some people to turn a lot of work over to so that we can actually focus on ministry of the word and what we need to do to actually grow people from one stage of growth to another and step them through these different um, steps that they go through. Now, if you look at the next uh, verse here, it says, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man from a full faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Simon, Paramius, Perminus, and Nicholas from Antioch. It tells you that these so the, you can see these, some of these, as it says, they were converts to Ju Ju Judaism. So some of these weren't even real Jews, but they became leaders because they were the type of person that the, type, the people who needed help. They were Hellenistic. They were, they were not the, in other words, they were the same kind. So they, in essence, they took people from this generation and said, you go talk to those people, you go talk to those people, because these are the people who could match that you can impact. So they gave them the biggest impact that they could give them because they gave them like people. And they presented these men. So they went out and got the seven men, came back and presented these men to the apostles, and they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to <laughs> We want to pray and lay our hands on some people so that they can be empowered to go and do, to get involved, get it done. It's not always working with your hands. Sometimes you have, multiple, um, you have multiple gifts, and some of you have gifts to speak. You have gifts to, you know, there's serving gifts where you use your hands, your arms, and everything else, and there's a lot of people in that category. But there are gifts where you just use your gift that you have. Some of you, you like telling people what to do. You're, you're an administrator. We need some folks who can, t but you just need to do it with the right motivation, <laughs> right? One of the biggest abuses of administrative gifts is getting people to do something for them, getting someone else to do something for the person who has the gift. And then the server type gifts are the ones who can't say no. So you have this loop. Server gifts who are upset, mad all the time because somebody asked them to do something that they can't say no to. And the person who's asking, they just want to get it done. So they don't really, anyway, so nobody's listening to anybody. Nobody's trying to impact anybody with the real love of God. It's just trying to get the work done. So we can't just focus on just getting the work done. We got to look at every generation and actually do the word that's in there because that's what happened. When they did this and they got this all set up, look at what the next verse says. It says, so the word of God spread. What spread? 
The word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So there were people who were motivated who weren't motivated before. Now, when you say priests that became obedient to the faith, you realize it was priests that just a few weeks before this, multiple weeks before this, who actually turned Jesus over to the Romans to crucify him. Now you have priests who are becoming obedient to the faith of the same person that they crucified. They're saying, he's alive. And that's what we need today. We need some people who are turned completely around, who've been taught one thing about Jesus that's not true, and they realize, I know it's true because now he's alive in me. And you can impact people to that point. And that's what God wants us to do. You know, um, the, the, there are people who have just stopped attending church. Not just because of the, the pandemic. Multiple people stop attending church because of the pandemic. But there were people who walked away from church before the pandemic. They went, you know, when they went to college, they left church. How many of you know some people like that? When they moved out, they left church. That's why they moved out, so they wouldn't have to go to church. <laughs> they ran away because they didn't want to go to church. They quit going to church when grandma died, and they didn't understand it. When mama died, and nobody could explain how God's love could still be present, and he took my mama, or my son, or my daughter, they, they can't find a reason to go on, but you have that kind of love on the inside of you that can show you the difference. And so here's a scripture that we want to use, that Jesus used just before his crucifixion. That was the whole motivation. He said, and so I'm giving a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I love you. And sometimes when we see the word just as much, and this is this particular translation, this is the Living Bible translation, um, this is really the impetus for your message that you're bringing. This is the kind of love, it's the kind of love, not necessarily the quantity of love. It's like when you say how much love, it's not the quantity of love, it's the type of love. Each generation needs to experience this kind of love. This type of love. We need to experience it. Every generation needs to experience it. And when he said um, love each other just as much as I have loved you. It's the kind of love that I have loved you with. And that is, I love you. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, love somebody because I love them. Love this person the way I love them, the same way I love you. You love them the way you know I love you, so you love them the way I love them. Let them know. The only way they can know that I love them the way I love them is if you love them the way I love you. Does that make sense? I mean, it was, I'm sure it was a circle, but the only way that people can know that Jesus loves them is if, the way he loves them is if we love them the way he loves us. And if we can show that kind of experience, show that kind of love, then people can experience it and begin to find that kind of love for themselves. Each generation needs to experience this kind of love. And that's why Jesus said to the disciples, he said, you know, your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Why, why do you think we need to prove something to the world? I mean, he said, if you love each other the way I've loved you, you can prove to the world that you are my disciples. It wasn't just that Jesus was their master, but think about this. Remember, I think I mentioned this scripture last week. I know I talked about it. I don't know if I put the scripture on the screen, but it was where Jesus was with his disciples. The house was full of people, and and his mama, his dad, I mean, not his daddy. Joseph would probably have passed away by then. But his mama and his sisters and brothers, they came to get him because they just felt like he was just out. He was, he was gone. We got to 
you know, we got to go get him. And then they sent word inside that said, you know, your, your mother is here. And so the disciple, one of the people came to Jesus and said, your mother's outside and your brothers and your sisters. Remember what Jesus said? He pointed to these the same disciples here. He pointed to them and said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? Then he pointed to them and said, these here are my mother, my brother, my sister. So Jesus pointed these men out to be dearer to him than his own blood family because of their commitment to the love of God. That's how important that love is. He said, love them the way I love you. So you're, ju you're just as important to me as my mama. You're just, this is Jesus saying this. <laughs> he wanted them to understand, you are just as important to me as my mama to the Virgin Mary. You are just as important to me as she is. And it's that kind of love that I want you to share with others. That kind of love. Your strong love will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So we love people who Jesus loved, and we love those people for Jesus' sake. You don't need to have any other reason. I love you because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you, and so I love you. So here's your challenge today. <coughs> your challenge is to engage your unique gifts and talents to contribute to the life of the church and contribute to the mission of the church. The life of the church, meaning the things that needs to go on inside of the church and the mission of the church is even reaching the people outside of the church. So here's some action steps that you can take today. Action steps. Short to, remember, and I mentioned this, because uh, let's admit it, the inconvenience is a problem, right? Let's just admit it. We, you know, it's an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience. To do anything for somebody else is mostly an inconvenience. And inconvenience is just trouble or difficulty that's caused, that causes me, you know, my own personal requirements and my own personal comfort to be interrupted. So we're asking you to interrupt your own personal comfort for a little while. And that's what this is saying. Short-term inconvenience for long-term greater good. That's what, that's what God wants us to do. It's, it's an inconvenience, but let's do it. So here's some ways. Some ways you can immediately contribute to the life and mission of your church. And that's both in person and online. Remember I said that we was going to show you how to do some things in person and online. Everybody can help. I, I want people excited about church, as I said. I want you to help us. We need your help to even do this. Where their elementary kids, this is their Church is their favorite day of the week instead of some school or some dance or some weekend thing. Church is their favorite place to be. We can make that happen. You can make that happen. We are the church. We can make that happen. Preschool kids, elementary age kids, kids in high school. I mean, kids who are without, I mean, when I think about myself, because I was raised in church, so I went through all those stages in school where church had a great influence on me. If it had not been for the church, even though you hear me talk about the things that they didn't do and that they got wrong, there were plenty of things that the church got right because I would not be here today if it wasn't for the church. I would not be myself if it wasn't for the church. We need the church. Every community needs a church in that community that's reaching out to the people in that community. You don't want to live in a community without a church. Without the influence of God's love on people who then influence other people with God's love. 
So everybody can help. Everybody can help. Here's one thing you can do. Ask someone to come sit with me Sunday. Easy, right? Come sit with me Sunday. If they say, for what, Sunday? That's my rest day. Just say, just come one, just one, just come sit with me one Sunday. Basically an hour, just a little over an hour. Just come sit with me for a little hour. And I mentioned to you that this is the title of a book. And actually, it's not a single author. I think there's 26 authors, authors in this book, but the editor um, uh, is, I'm trying to think of the editor's name. I'll show you the book here in a minute. But it's talking about how to delight in differences and, and how to honor the values of others, and where people, especially people who don't look like you, and how to, to connect before you correct. <laughs> Remember that one? And then helping people to just where you can just trust that God is at work even if it doesn't look like he is. Even if people disappoint me, I still realize that God is at work. God is at work here. In this person's life, God is at work. And, and as we love Jesus and serve others, we realize that we can just ask people to come sit with me. So ask somebody for next Sunday, come sit with me uh, this coming Sunday. This is the book. This is what it looks like. So come sit with me. Uh, I th oh, man, I thought I had the author's name on there. Um, I'll give you the author's name later. I thought I had it in there. But anyway, I don't. But here, here's the next action step. Sign up to help with certain things at church. So I have a couple things here. And today, you can do this today. You, we've listed some areas where we need some immediate help in. And we want your help, even if this is your first time here, second time, third time, even if you're online today and somebody invited you and this is your first time watching, do this. Go along with us on this one. So when we say sign up for help with production, video, audio, greeting, parking, these are just some areas that I'm highlighting today, and help with online audience, all of these things, we're just going to step through some things so that you can do this. Uh, another one is sign up uh, to serve our children or our students there's so many things that we intend to do with students and with, with our kids. And then also check into being a part of a small group. How, would, how many of you would, well, I won't ask that question. Because you might not know what a small group is yet, and I'll tell you later. But and you can check into being a leader of a small group. But help host our online audience. All of these things we need some help with now. So today... Everybody can play a part, even if this is your first time. And I'm not asking you to sign up to do this today, but I am asking you to sign up to, well, I'm inviting you to, a, we're going to schedule a meet, a one-hour meeting. How many of you can give up one hour? Just one hour. We're going to schedule a one-hour meeting where we'll explain what it means for you based on your gifts, based on what you'd like to do to help us and show you how you can help us. Just a one-hour meeting that we're going to do that. So all you're signing up to do is just to be invited to that meeting, and we'll schedule that meeting. So if you scan this code right here, you go ahead, get your phones out. Even if you're already working, even if you're already working and you're doing 10 things at the church, Go ahead, scan this code, and complete it. This registers you for the one-hour meeting that we're going to schedule. Scan that code, fill out the information, and submit it. And once you submit it, we'll have that information. Those of you online, get your other phone. <laughs> scan this code. If, you are, if you're here in the building today, this code is on the back side of the challenge that we give you every week. You can take it with you, and you can, you can help other people do the same thing um, later on. You can take one of these copies with you so that we can get some help to do what we, what God has called us to do, that we can impact people's lives. That's, that, this, Last week's message led up to this, and next week's message is going to be the same kind of message. So 
please invite somebody to come sit with you. And then next week, we're going to talk about some, some more of this same kind of stuff. Because Sundays, we want to talk about the power of Sunday. That's what we need to do. So while you are completing what you're doing, um, I'm going to do... I'm going to do prayer a different way today because some of you are busy. I'm, I want to pray for you right now while some of you are even doing what you're doing because it's, it's important that you're doing what you're doing as you're signing up. I just want to pray as you're doing this and immediately when I dismiss, if you have, so stop and listen to me just for a minute. If you have any need of prayer for anything after we dismiss, I'm going to have a person at the connection area right outside these two doors and also a person downstairs at our connection area. Just go to either one of those two areas. If you have a need for prayer, if you have a need, you want to connect with the church, if you have a need, you want to give your life to Christ, any of those things, any step that you'd like to take, you just, or if you don't even, if you just need some help completing this, just go and help and have somebody help you at one of those areas. But right now, uh, go ahead and finish what you're doing as I pray, and then I'm going to dismiss you. So, Father, we just thank you today for this message. I thank you for the hearts of men, women, children, teenagers, every area of life. I thank you, God, that hearts are open today to not only receive this and benefit from it, but also to get involved not to just consume your word, not to just consume your spirit, not to just consume all the emotional uh, good feelings and joy that comes with the blessings, but to get involved and be a blessing, to get involved and be the hands and feet of Jesus. I thank you for hearts that are open to that today, and we honor you and give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So God bless you, and um, please go ahead, and if you need to talk to someone, I want you to do that. Don't leave without talking to somebody today. God bless you.